All right, we were discussing you know, the issue of voter ID uh, and how 700,000 Pennsylvanians don't have uh, government issued identification. Uh, representatives like Gary Day have been voting for bills like the voter ID, for the. Uh, and, and Gary is a strong supporter of this bill. And the, the women's ultrasound bill, uh, in, uh, implementing. Uh, regulations on abortion clinics which will make abortions unavailable in Pennsylvania instead of doing things to create jobs. No, I, I mean, we're putting an undue burden on, on some of the poorest and, and, and most at risk in, in, in society. I mean, not only with access to, to receiving voter identification, people who may live in inner city and not have access, uh, easy access to these offices where maybe a 30 minute bus trip or an hour or an hour and a half walk, um, or people who are in retirement homes who may simply have no avenue to, to get their required ID to vote. Um, and this puts them in, 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 in an incredibly unfair position. And, and one of the things that I've seen across the nation with states who have implemented bills like this you know, and, and this happened in Wisconsin last year, for, for instance. They implement the bill, and in our poorer communities, all of a sudden the DMVs start cutting hours. Probably We're in Wisconsin, they actually closed DMVs in heavily Democratic areas. And then, uh, conveniently enough, in, in the more affluent areas, uh, in, in the areas that tend to vote Republican, not only were the DMV operations continued, but they were actually expanded. So, you know, this is, you know, for, for, for what is ostensibly stamping out fraud, it is incredibly partisan, it's incredibly political in its nature, and, and I, I find it uh, you know, seeing that, that the yeah. Corbett administration and representatives like Gary Day are willing to spend four to eleven million dollars in taxpayers' money to help them win elections. I don't want to see my money being spent to facilitate uh, the success of the Republican Party in Pennsylvania. Well, meanwhile, too, funds for disabled citizens, uh, for uh, developmentally uh, uh, you know, uh, develop people are being cut, uh, funds for abused children are being cut, uh, funds for uh, the, the Conservation Parks Recreation Fund, Governor says he's going to eliminate, uh, but we're spending money on this. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing that they create this myth that, that, that Pennsylvania is so cash poor that we need to cut vital government services and yet they can turn around and, and put forth a bill and pass a bill that, that serves no legitimate purpose and, and costs us a great deal of money. All right. So what would you do in Harrisburg differently? Oh, I mean, I'm going to be accountable, I'm going to be honest. Uh, and, and, and one of my, one of my big things, uh, you know, unlike so many people we, we, we see in government currently who, who want to restrict your rights, you know, the rights that you already have uh, or the rights that, you know, many in the community should have and, and don't currently have. Um, we see with the tra transvaginal ultrasound bill, which, which thankfully because of public pressure, because of, you know, good people across the state being outraged as, as, as they should have been, uh, you know, that's been killed in, 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 in the House and the State Senate, but my goodness, uh, you know, have these people no shame. If, if, if we leave them unchecked, if we leave people like Gary Day and, and Tom Corbett unchecked, what restrictions will they, they, they place on our, our civil liberties and our constitutionally guaranteed rights? Well, what qualifications does Gary Day have medically to be such an expert on, on medical procedures, especially legal medical procedures, that he'd insert himself between a woman and her doctor. And I would say uh, I don't. Uh, I don't think he has any qualifications. I mean, his his degree is in economics. Uh, I don't know if, if you know a bachelor's degree in economics makes you more qualified than a medical doctor. I would say it does not. And considering that you know this bill isn't creating jobs or helping the economy in any way, it's not like uh, it's not like Gary knows some some secret about this that, that none of us do. I mean, it, it's it's something again. Uh, you know, it's purely ideological, but it, it's 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 taking the form of, of something that affects the, the health and mental welfare of, of, of so many women in, in Pennsylvania. Because you know, if 
if the goal were to, to reduce the number of abortions in Pennsylvania, there are things we could do. Um, you know, we can make sure that uh, expecting parents have, have access to, to greater social services, that we make the adoption procedure easier. I mean, there are, there are many things that, that well-meaning pro-life people could do that would not restrict the constitutional rights of, of women who are, are seeking to terminate a pregnancy. In this case, it's a medical procedure that serves no medical purpose, and, and we've seen that in the medical community across Pennsylvania coming out against this bill, because they say, this doesn't help. Right. Uh, now, the governor you, says mm -hmm. all a woman has to do is just close her eyes. And that's, that is astonishing. If you, if, if you read the bill itself, I mean, women are given the choice to observe the monitor, but they don't have the choice to have the monitor removed. So the monitor's in the room at all times, uh, directly in their eyesight, and their options are to turn away or close their eyes. And this is being documented by the technician who is performing the ultrasound procedure. And, and in many cases, this is an ultrasound procedure that these women have already undergone with, without this invasive quality to it, and they're being forced to undergo it again uh, within 24 hours of seeking uh, termination of pregnancy, which means they have to make, a, for a, mm -hmm. a, many of them, a return trip. Yeah, because it, it's not something that could be uh, considered part of the, the termination procedure okay. itself. It has to be a separate appointment, it has to be a right. separate expenditure. At least 24 hours so, beforehand. So for many women, uh, not only is it incredibly expensive, but it's going to be something that, you know, is restricted uh, the amount of time that they, they have. So if, if you're somebody who has an issue of transportation, or if you may not have uh, ready access to a facility that can conduct this procedure, um, there's very little you can do. All right. So anyone who's disturbed by bills like this, and, and uh, for state representatives like Gary Day who support it, uh, you suggest they just open their eyes and vote for Joe Haas instead? I, I, I think that's a great idea. I, I want everybody to go on the, the uh, voting booth with eyes open. And I, 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 I certainly believe that we don't want our leaders in Pennsylvania telling us to close our eyes to what's going on. Um, you know, Pennsylvania is a, a great state. We're capable of, of, of great things. There's nothing that we should be ashamed of. There's nothing that we should be frightened of. There's no reason to, to close our eyes to what's going on. All right. And I, I think you know, if we open our eyes to what the Corbett administration has done for the last two years and what Gary Day has done in office for the last four years and what the Republicans have been doing in this district for the last 30 years, we can make a big difference. Uh, talk about Harrisburg for a second. Uh, just recent days, uh, Senator Jane Ory has been on trial. Uh, Bill DeWeese, former Speaker of the House, is uh, set to be sentenced to prison on uh, primary day. John Prezell, former Speaker of the House, was sentenced up to five years in prison this week. Uh, former Senator Bob Mello was indicted on federal charges. Um, Harrisburg's been a cesspool of corruption. How do you go to Harrisburg and not sink into that pit? Well, I, I, I think the Harrisburg system uh, encourages this sort of behavior. I mean, as, as many people know, we have one of the largest state legislatures in the country and one of the most expensive. Uh, so our elected officials are making upwards of eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 a year in salary. They're making uh, you know, being compensated in the form of pensions, they're being compensated in the form of uh, health care that most Pennsylvanians do not have, you know, equivalent access to. And after, uh, John, I believe it's three terms, uh, the health care and pension become, become lifetime. So we are paying for these people, uh, you know, well after they cease serving us in any productive way. Well, so not we, only that, but there are two current congressman Joe Pitts and Jim Gerlach who came out of the Pennsylvania legislature who are uh, relying on their state I think Charlie again as well okay on their state benefits they have foregone their federal congressional health care and pension uh, because they're they're drawing on their state uh, no, and, plans. And it's outrageous and I, and I, I, I think a lot of people are not as informed as they should be about how 
much waste we see in, in Harrisburg at the legislative level. So I mean, it's not only the legislators themselves, but their staff expenses. You know, we're sending people to Harrisburg, and you know, in ten years, in terms of salary, in terms of benefits, we're talking a million dollars, one point two million dollars in. in uh, expenditures and what are we getting for that right. and in cases like like every day I don't think we're getting our money's worth yeah. how long do you think somebody should serve the public and, and it's public service when you know a dedicated public servant does go to some place like Harrisburg and serves honorably um, what should the minimum be before they say get their pension vested or uh, you know there should probably not be any lifetime Benefit, health benefits unless you retire. Yeah, I, th I, I think the lifetime health benefit is incredibly excessive. Uh, for pensions, I would say, you know, after three 15 years or something, 10, I, 15 I years. I don't, want to, I don't want to be yeah. encouraging people to serve for, for 10 or 15 years. Uh, okay. you know, I'm somebody who favors term limits. I, I favor uh, four terms. And I, I know this is something that that's never going to pass because you know, much like trying to convince these guys to cut their own wages, for many people, a state house job or a state senate job is a job for life. And I mean, that's something that's, that's broken with our system. But you know, once you're in office, you know, very few people have the uh, political will to actually do something that, that may affect themselves financially or may affect their high standard of living. Uh, and so as I said, I favor uh, you know, a limit of four terms in office in any one uh, position. So that would be state house or, or state senate. I, uh, I pledge to only serve four terms if I'm elected. I, I think that's uh, incredibly reasonable. Uh, you know, I want to I want to create millionaires across the state, but I don't want to be creating them necessarily in Harrisburg and necessarily in the state capital. All right. Um, some of the other problems that are inherent in Harrisburg. Uh, one is campaign finance. Uh, there are no limits to how much money somebody can contribute to a candidate. Uh, on the state level in Pennsylvania, uh, would you change that? I I would seek to impose a, a, a reasonable limit. Uh, I don't offhand know what a reasonable limit would be. I, I, I the federal limit currently is uh, I believe forty eight hundred dollars. So split between the two election cycles mm -hmm. uh, for a state race like state house or state senate, uh, that would be very. Uh, I mean, that would certainly be sufficient for somebody who's contributing to, to a race of, of that magnitude. For, for something statewide, be it uh, governor or attorney general, perhaps we could, could raise the limit a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, it, it's incredibly disconcerting that, that one or two big-time donors can essentially finance a uh, candidate's campaign. And then, you know, if they get into to office, how do we know who the, the candidate will be accountable for. Are they going to be accountable to the people who elected them, or are they going to be accountable to the... Uh, people who wrote $50,000 checks. Exactly. And I mean, that's something we've seen happen. That's something we saw happen in, in, in Reading uh, in, in 2000. It was 2008, Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we had a state senate candidate uh, who had one donor bankroll his entire campaign to the term, tune of $30,000. Yeah. And I mean... It's, it's astonishing that, that some donors can have that much of an effect on, on a candidate's uh, campaign. And I mean, in, in, in those cases, yeah, we, we don't know who they're beholden to. Mm. Another issue is uh, lobbying uh, disclosure. Uh, the rules in Harrisburg for uh, disclosure of lobbyist activities are, are very liberal, uh, very open. Um, We've had situations where legislators were flown to the Super Bowl by uh, energy companies and stuff, um, and you know very little of this is disclosed. Yeah. Uh, what would your position and, and be on that? Haven't we also seen instances where, where current elected officials were working on the side as lobbyists as well? Well, and we've also seen legislators who hold two, three, and, and four different positions simultaneously in the public sector. Uh, state representatives like Kate Harper, mm -hmm. who also work as solicitors for various municipalities, uh, in addition to being a state representative. And I, it's, it's astonishing that people who 
have, you know, are in the position to, to make legislation are also in the position to influence legislation for profit for themselves. And I think mean, this is something we, we obviously need to look into. Uh, I don't believe that uh, state representatives and state senators should be working on the side as lobbyists. I think it undermines uh, the public's confidence in, in the state legislature, and I, I think it leads to a, a much lower quality of service from, from those representatives. And I, I know, you know some very good representatives have done this, some very, you know, very dubious representatives have done this too. I don't think it's right for, for anybody in Harrisburg to, to be employed as a lobbyist while serving in uh, the State House. All right, we, well, we've talked about you some, we've talked about Gary Day some, but you also have a primary opponent, uh, the primary uh, for this seat, the Democratic primary is April 24th. Why should the voters in the, the Democratic voters in the 187th vote for Joe Haas? Well, John, I, I you know, my focus, as you know, is on creating quality jobs, making sure that we have uh, high quality public education in Pennsylvania preserved. Uh, you know, the real issues that affect Pennsylvanians and affect Pennsylvanians in this district particularly, we have the public university, we have some amazing uh, school districts, and we want to make sure that we continue to uphold that high quality commitment to making sure that the, the district, uh, you know, is in a position to succeed moving forward. I don't think the priorities of my primary opponent are necessarily reflective of the voters in this district. Um, I understand the concern about uh, fracking and, and, and gas drilling in the Marcel Shell, but to say that this is the prior, priority issue in, 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 in you know, Eastern Berks County and Northwestern Lehigh County is, is, is simply not true. Um, and I, I would say, if, if you ask a voter, and I, I've spoken to probably a thousand voters this campaign so far, you know, face to face, if you, if you ask them what, what really matters, it's jobs, it's education, it's personal rights and personal liberties issues, and none of these things will be afterthoughts today. Um, you know, this is not something that comes behind my fairly radical environmental views. It's not something that would come, you know, after, you know, I, I seek changes that, and this is hard to say respectfully, but, but that very few people in Harrisburg uh, would be even willing to listen to. I've, I've spoken with current elected officials uh, on, on, on both sides, and, and the response was, well, fracking is a dead issue. I mean, this is something that, that's been settled. You know, we can continue to work to make uh, severance tax uh, more, more reasonable, more fair, something that can make sure that we have revenue that we need in Pennsylvania, and also the revenue that we need to make sure everything is done safely, with correct oversight, with uh, the sort of regulation we need, but this isn't going away. And to, to, to campaign on, on, on the premise of banning the practice completely is, is something that uh, both voters and, and legislatures, the legislature will, will reject uh, wholeheartedly. So to to have the focus of the campaign be on uh, something so radical and so out of touch with the district gives me serious concern about my primary opponent's chances to succeed in November. I mean, this is not an easy district to win. Last time we had Democratic representation was 1982. And you know, we've come close. Uh, in 2006, we had a tremendous candidate in Archie Fulweiler, came within 400 votes of winning. In 2008, we had a tremendous candidate in John Ritter. Uh, John, unfortunately, during the primary, was diagnosed with leukemia, so he was not as active as I, as I know he wanted to be, but he came within four percentage points of, of winning in 2008. So it's a, it's a winnable district. It is a winnable yeah. district, and I don't think we should you know, sacrifice a winnable district to somebody who is essentially right. a protest candidate. Okay. Uh, the bulk of the district lies in Lehigh County. Yes. Uh, you're residing in, in Kutztown. Yes, How do you uh, garner support in the, the Lehigh majority part of the, the district? Well, I mean, I've, I've been, uh, you know, since day one, in touch with the Lehigh County Democratic Committee. I've... Uh, you know, attended their events as, as best I could. I mean, they are tremendously active out there. Bar Johnson's doing a fantastic job getting getting the county committee into shape. We have 
great people on the Democratic side uh, who are in office or seeking office who have been helpful in in not only reaching out to voters but also you know educating me in some of the, <laughs> the finer points of, of legislation. So you know what we see in Lehigh, we see some tremendously involved and dedicated people who really want to make a difference. Uh, now, now parts of Lehigh are, are you know, very difficult to, to get access to. Uh, you know it's pretty tough terrain up there and unfortunately because of some of the issues that we've had with, with candidates in the past we've never made that uh, level of penetration that we need to, to make sure that voters in Heidelberg and Weisenberg and, and Lynn Township know that you know, we have a viable Democratic candidate who you know, seeks to serve them. I mean, if they're Republican or Democrat they should know that whoever's elected will represent them and will listen to them and one of the things I plan to do, and I've been doing, is to you know, work my towel off to, to get out there and to talk to everybody I possibly can and make sure that they know we have a good Democrat on the ticket and to know that you know, we can win this. And if we do win this, we're going to make this district a heck of a lot better. All right. Well, thank you very much, Joe. Yeah. Thank you, John.